Hi, my name is Marit van Dijk, and I'm here today to talk to you about keeping dependencies in check. Um, we we'll probably all use open source, so usually I ask who uses open source software in their work projects or um, side projects. So I think a better question is who doesn't? Anyone? No one, right. So an open source is great um, because we get functionality for free without having to write it ourselves um, so that we can focus on delivering business value faster. We won't have to write our own application frameworks or testing frameworks or a lot of other stuff that we need. But also there are downsides because for each dependency that we declare, we pull in transitive dependencies. Um, and if we're unlucky, they might clash because different dependencies use different transitive dependencies and uh, we need to resolve that. Um, adding those dependencies to our binaries means that our binaries are bigger and the uh, uh, startup times are slower. And uh, finally, as we've seen this past year, there might be, oh wait, one too far. Uh, there might be vulnerabilities in our dependencies that we're using. So, um, damn it, sorry, fighting my clicker. Um, so in December last year, we had uh, lots of fun with uh, Log4Shell, um, which was a vulnerability in the Log4J uh, logging library that lots of us use. Uh, and the vulnerability was, uh, not everyone, okay, fine. <laughs> um, the vulnerability was so severe that we needed to update all of our um, applications. And I was working at uh, Bull.com at the time, uh, where uh, we have a microservices architecture. So uh, teams are responsible for multiple repositories that had to be updated. Or in our case, we had to update them twice, because after the first vulnerability, uh, oh wait, uh, after the first vulnerability was found, there were other vulnerabilities that were disclosed. Uh, so we had to update it again. Um, and then in March, um, a vulnerability was found in Spring, uh, Spring for Shell. So we got to do it again. But at least we got some practice, so it was faster this time. Um, but overall, yeah, using dependencies has pros and cons, like pretty much everything in software de development, it depends, right? So I've seen, there are several ways we can deal with that. Uh, on the one hand, I've seen teams who are very, very reluctant to add any dependencies at all, to the point where they're writing their own mocks and not using any existing mocking frameworks, um, and writing as much as they can themselves, so that they have more control. Um, so the upside is you have less dependencies uh, that you need to keep up to date, uh, but the downside, of course, is that you have to write everything yourself. On the other hand, um, there are people who don't think about what they're bringing in. It's, if there's a problem that we can solve with a, a hip new library, then let's just do that. Uh, you know, you might have heard something at a conference, so you want to give that a try. You implement it and, uh, and keep it. Um, you might have uh, other hot new technology that you heard about that you want to try out. Uh, or you might just copy something off of Stack Overflow, which is a solution that adds a new dependency. Um, hopefully you will have some balance in between these things and think about which dependencies you want to use um, and, and consider uh, before you add dependencies whether you want to use them and have take on the, the maintenance. Uh, some of the things you might want to consider, the first thing is um, does this dependency fit the problem that we're trying to solve? So does it do the thing that we want it to do? Is the size of the dependency relative to the size of the problem? Are we bringing on other problems? Uh, for example, I've seen a lot of projects that use uh, string utils, but then only use it for one method. Do you want to bring on an extra dependency, or do you want to just write that method yourself? Or if you're already using Jackson, you don't need JSON or vice versa. Um, the next thing is to think about uh, how well maintained a project is. So we want to look at the number of commits or releases uh, and the number of active maintainers and committers. Because there's an XKCD for everything. 
Um, some projects are maintained by one person, and what happens if uh, that person is no longer able to maintain the project? Um, a lot of open source software is maintained by volunteers who don't get paid, who do it on their spare time. Um, something that's, that's mentioned uh, in relation to this is sometimes called the bus factor. So how many people could get hit by a bus before the project becomes unmaintained? Which I think is a rather macabre expression, so I prefer to use the lottery factor. How many people can win the lottery, no longer have to work on this stuff, they can move to a tropical island or given the state of the world, maybe a mountaintop, uh, before the uh, pr uh, project becomes unmaintained. You might want to consider the community surrounding uh, a particular um, project. If it's popular, there will be a larger community of people who are writing and talking about it, uh, who are um, using it and might be able to help you if you have problems. Um, Maybe they might even uh, help fix bugs and become committers or maintainers, although um, the balance between users and main committers and maintainers is, um, yeah, it's usually not enough. Um, and you want to consider if the community is welcoming and helpful, so are they going to be kind to you if you have questions on how to use stuff? Can you reach out and will they help you? Um, you want to consider, uh, is it easy to implement and to use? Uh, is the documentation any good? Uh, and also, do you like using it? Sometimes you have a preference for one library over another um, for personal reasons or because you're more familiar or um, technical reasons. Um, another thing is, what is the impact of using a particular dependency? Um, if you are using string utils and you want to remove it, it's usually quite contained, so you can replace it with something else, or write the function yourself, or use uh, Kotlin standard libraries if you're moving to Kotlin. Uh, but if you're using, for example, Lombok or Reactor, it will spread through your entire code base, much like dandelions through your entire yard. Ask me how I know. Um, and finally, if you decided that you want to use a dependency, make sure that you're using the latest stable version and that it doesn't have any vulner known vulnerabilities because you don't want to add known vulnerabilities to your project. So what are some of the places that you can find this information? Uh, one place where uh, I usually started to look was a Maven repository. You can find the dependency. Uh, you can find what different versions there are and when they were released, and also you can see whether there are any known vulnerabilities. Um, for example, in, uh, if you click on one of the versions that does have a known vulnerability, um, it will provide information about the CVE with a link to more information about that particular vulnerability, and it will tell you that there's a newer version. You can also look at the code. Um, on GitHub or wherever the, the project lives. Uh, for the ones that I've used, mostly that would be GitHub. You can see the latest commits, the number of commits, the latest release, the number of releases. You can also see uh, the number of people who are watching it or who have start or forked the project. So that will give you an, an idea of how popular the project is. Although I tend to also star stuff that I want to look at sometime later uh, to add to my ever-growing list of rabbit holes. Um, you might want to look at issues to see whether there are any open issues regarding the functionality that you want to use, um, and look at pull requests and issues to see how the community interacts with uh, their users. So are they kind when people are asking questions? Do they respond to pull requests? Uh, and you might want to look at the insights to see um, what activity there is on the project, uh, with how many commits are done over time, who, how many committers there are, how active they are, uh, things like that. So also we have the um, package search functionality and package search website. So on the package search website, you can find information about uh, dependencies, much like you can find on Maven repository and GitHub. Uh, but it's combined, and uh, package search is integrated in uh, IntelliJ IDEA as of 2021.2. So you can also find this information straight in your IDE if you're using IntelliJ. Who is using IntelliJ? Check question, who is not using IntelliJ? Okay. 
um, thank you. Um, so here you can find the clicker doesn't quite work. Um, and also you can find the si similar information that you can find on uh, Maven repository and GitHub. Uh, so the latest release, what type of license is being used, uh, who the developers are, but also tags on Stack Overflow if you want to see if there are questions uh, being asked and answers, answered on Stack Overflow, uh, links to the website and the source code, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, a list of versions similar to uh, Maven repository. So most of us will have, since we're all using open source software, we'll have um, dependencies that we need to maintain, which isn't my favorite activity. I'd much rather be coding. Um, so I wanted to have a look at some of the tools that we can use to um, make it easier on ourselves. And I'm going to start with some basics and then uh, move on to uh, more complicated or newer tools. So even if you have nothing else, you're probably using Maven or Gradle, you can use them to check what dependencies you have. So you can ask for the dependency tree, which will tell you the declared dependencies that you have and the transitive dependencies that they bring in. You can use Maven to check for updates, which is what I used to do years ago um, before we had any bots or other tools. Um, so you can see which versions or which dependencies have newer versions so that you can update them. Um, and you can use Maven Dependency Analyze to see if you have any um, unused declared dependencies that you might want to remove if you're actually not using them. Uh, you can do similar things in uh, Gradle. I'm more familiar with Maven than I am with Gradle. Um, but Gradle also, you can ask for the dependency tree. If you want to see dependency updates, you need to add a plugin, uh, like the Ben Mains one. And I have not found uh, a plugin that does something similar to the Analyze, Maven Analyze. So if you are using Gradle and you know of a good plugin, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, like I said, the package search is in, integrated in IntelliJ IDEA, which means that uh, you can search for dependencies straight in your manifest file. I'm using Maven for the example, uh, but you can just search uh, for the dependency right in the pom.xml. And you do need uh, internet connectivity so that it can connect with the package search API, uh, but it will find the uh, corresponding uh, dependencies so you can add them to your pom, pom file without having to look it up uh, elsewhere. Um, of course, it won't find dependencies from your private uh, or corporate uh, Maven repositories. Um, you can also use uh, suggestions from IntelliJ. Uh, you'll see the squigglies uh, that signify, hey, there's a newer version here that we'd like to suggest. And you can use Option Enter on Mac or Alt Enter on Windows to um, go through the suggestions. So you can update them right there. And that works also in a build Gradle uh, file. Uh, also, there's the dependencies window where you can update all of your dependencies. By the way, for the example, I'm using an old project uh, that I built in 2017 and haven't updated since. So the code is crap, but it's the perfect example to show you outdated dependencies. So yay for your GitHub cemetery, um, or mine in this case. So here you see... Um, the dependencies that are being used. You can change the scope, uh, you can change the versions, uh, you can upgrade uh, individually or upgrade them all. And on my left, your right, you see the same information from the package search, so information about this dependency. Um, you can search for dependencies in the dependency tool window and add them to your project if you want. And if you're using Ultimate Edition, then also it will highlight if you have a vulnerable de sorry can't english a vulnerable dependency and tell you to update and this also provides you information on which vulnerabilities are found with links to more information about those vulnerabilities um, and that's provided by checkmarks a security company uh, in partnership with jetbrains so all of the tools that we that we looked at are uh, things that you can uh, probably use in your project, uh, but they do mean that you have to check out each individual project and run some commands or look at your um, manifest files and then apply those um, updates and verify that everything still works. 
So the next set of tools would be to use uh, software composition analysis. There are lots and lots of tools out there that you can use for this. I forgot what the one is that we used at Bull.com, <laughs> but it's, uh, we had an internal tool that would show us um, uh, the results of those scans. It would scan all of our repositories and our uh, base images, and each team would have a dashboard where they could see for their uh, repositories whether there were any vulnerabilities, and we could drill down to see the severity of them and whether, we, whether there are new versions. Um, so we would have one place where we could see for all of our repositories what needed work instead of having to check each one out uh, individually. So the upside is you get this overview, but the downside is you do still need to go to the dashboard to check whether anything needs updating. Um, so in one of the teams I was in, we had a task to do that periodically and then either update minor uh, dependencies or plan work if there, if there was more work to be done. But there are better tools uh, that you can hopefully have access to. Uh, one is to use bots that can uh, check this stuff for you. Um, if you're using uh, Java, there are three options. There are more bots out there, but uh, these are the three that cover Java. Uh, Dependables, Renovate, and Sneak Open Source. So I want to have a look at the differences between uh, those three. Uh, and I implemented them on my GitHub repo. They do work on other platforms as well. Um, but I'm just looking at the differences between the bots for now. Um, so Dependable is GitHub native. It offers three features. It can uh, send you alerts. It can uh, do perform uh, security updates, create PRs for security updates, and it can create uh, version update uh, PRs. Um, because it's GitHub native, it's really easy to um, implement on GitHub. You can uh, enable it via your profile settings, uh, code security and analysis. Here you can enable the alerts and or the security updates. So if you have the alerts enabled, if your repository has um, vulnerable dependencies, you'll get this yellow box saying there are um, vulnerabilities that are found. And if you click the button, you will get the list of the vulnerabilities that were found. If you enable the security updates, you'll get PRs on your repository that look like this. Um, and you can interact with them with some basic commands to say uh, whether you want to close, ignore, or merge, or rebase, or reopen them. Um, and if you want to do version updates as well, you need to add a dependable YAML configuration file, which also has impact on the security updates that are done. You need to provide what package manager you're using and where your manifest file is. You can set the frequency to daily, weekly, or monthly. You can schedule uh, when it should run. You can configure the maximum number of PRs, which will default to five, but you can change that. And you can uh, configure some additional details on how to deal with the PRs, like who to assign them to, whether it needs reviews, uh, what the commit message should look like, uh, whether to add labels, uh, things like that. So the next option is renovate, which is what we used at bull.com. Um, and uh, on GitHub, that's av available via GitHub app. On GitLab, which is what we use at Bull.com, there's a few more steps, uh, which were well documented. So uh, we added that to our projects. Uh, Renovate offers security updates and a dashboard for your project with an overview of the security updates that are needed for that project. So on GitHub, to configure it, uh, you can do that via the app. And if you click Configure, you get the option to enable it for all of your repositories or selected repositories only. So if you want to give it a try, this is fairly easy to try it on just one repository. Once you enable it, it will create a configuration PR with basic configuration. And once you merge that PR, it will start running. Um, so the configuration options that you have are all repositories or selected repositories only. Uh, the configuration file is, is created for you. Uh, you can set the maximum number of PRs, but also the maximum number of concurrent branches. So it's a bit more fine-tuned. And the same, you can set the same options with um, regarding who to assign or review and, and things like that. But they're 
more options and they are a bit more fine-tuned than for dependables. Uh, so the PRs might look like this, uh, uh, or at least they do on GitHub, uh, and they provide you with some more information like the age of the package that uh, they want you to, uh, or that is suggested, uh, the adoption rate of, of Renovate users who are using that release, um, the percentage of updates that have passing tests, and the confidence level that they have determined, where neutral means that either they don't have enough information yet, or they are not able to determine the confidence level based on the information that they have. Uh, and like I said, it will provide a dashboard of all of the dependencies that need updating on, in this case, my very, very old project. Um, the final option is Sneak Open Source, um, which is available via Sneak. Uh, it, feature, it has uh, multiple features, so security updates and version updates, uh, but also the option to test for new vulnerabilities on incoming PRs, and the ability to uh, test for vulnerabilities in your source code, although there are other tools that do that too, and it will provide you with dashboards of the number of vulnerabilities in your repositories. To enable Sneak on GitHub, you go through their website, authorize it, um, oh, sorry, too fast. It will offer you the option to apply it to either the public repos only or uh, public and private repositories. And you can set uh, the, the features that you want to use. You'll need to create a personal access token. And once it's enabled, it will start running uh, and create PRs for you. Uh, this is what they look like. So they also provide some additional information uh, like uh, Renovate. Um, well, more than dependable, but less than renovate. So they provide the severity of the vulnerability, uh, the priority and why they say it has that particular priority, um, as well as which version, whether they consider it a breaking change, uh, which is uh, dependent on the version numbers, as well as whether they had reports that they know that there are breaking changes in the API uh, and, and some other information. What uh, Sneak does that the other two don't do by default is it will bundle PRs or bundle changes if they are uh, related to the same artifact. You can configure Renovate to do that too, um, but you have to configure it and Sneak does it automatically. There are defaults. There are defaults. <laughs> exactly, so Sneak does it by default. Renovate needs to be configured. Uh, thanks, Maris. Um, and like I said, Sneak can do a PR check on your PRs to make sure that you're not adding vulnerable uh, dependencies, which the other two do not. And they provide a, a nice dashboard, which you may or may not already have in, in a different tool. So the configuration options are a little bit less. Uh, you can uh, set the frequency, you can enable or disable uh, either new vulnerabilities only, so that are disclosed as of now, or known vulnerabilities if you want to work on your backlog. Um, I don't know why you'd want to make that distinction. I'd want to get rid of all of them, but you do have the option, and you can enable or disable PRs for uh, single projects. So overall, I mean, it might vary for different platforms, but they're fairly easy to add to your repositories. They will create automatic PRs for you, so you don't have to watch for new versions. Um, but the downside is it can create a lot of noise, especially if you first implement them, you'll get spammed with lots of PRs, fun times, and you'll have to manage those PRs. So you need to um, still need to evaluate, do we want to merge this now? Do we want to deploy this now? Because even if your build passes, that doesn't automatically mean that everything is okay. It depends on the quality of your test suite as well. We had an interesting update to failsafe where once we merged that, actually our integration tests didn't run anymore, so we had to revert that. Probably some property changed or, or whatever. Um, and when you deploy it, you might want to make sure that everything still works in production, that your error log doesn't explode and other things. So you still need some time and attention to uh, yeah, deploy them to production. And if, there are, if your build fails uh, on one of those PRs, 
either some of your tests are failing or there are breaking changes in the API, so you need to look into that and you might need to apply code changes and none of these bots can do that for you. So that's where migration tools can come in handy and I'm gonna look at some options, uh, definitely not all. Uh, obviously, since I work for JetBrains now, um, I want to mention that JetBrains has some uh, functionality uh, to help you migrate. Uh, so there are a few options that are built in if you still need to move from Java EE to Jakarta or from JUnit 4 to 5 um, or uh, J use JavaFX. There are some built-in migrations that you can use. Um, and we have uh, videos on our IntelliJ IDEA YouTube channel uh, that describe how to do it. Uh, you can also create your own migration. Um, and for example, the JUnit 4 to 5 migration looks like this, so it will replace the JUnit 4 classes with the JUnit 5 classes, but you'll still need to change out the dependencies yourself. So it does a part of the migration, but not everything for you. Another tool um, that you might be aware of, because uh, Sander Mack did a talk on this, um, both last year at JFall and this spring at JSpring, uh, it's not technically a migration tool, but you can use it to migrate some, uh, some code. Uh, it's a static analysis tool for Java that catches common programming mistakes. It works with Maven, Gradle, Ant, and Bazel. There's also plugins for IntelliJ IDEA and Eclipse, and a command line tool. And it has a bunch of bug patterns, known bug patterns, uh, that it can find for you and you can configure it either to report or fix them, and the fixing part is where it sort of migrates your code from a known bug pattern to um, an improvement or a fix for that bug pattern, and you can also add custom checks to it. Um, it includes a tool called Refaster, where you can have a before and after templates to migrate your code, and uh, Sander in his talks described how they also used it to migrate from Java 8 to 11, for example. Uh, so if you want to have a look at that, uh, there, here's a link to uh, the one from last JSpring. There's an updated version at, uh, from DevOps from a few weeks ago. Um, so the other tool that I wanted to mention is Open Rewrite, which is a refactoring tool. It's a source code refactoring tool for framework migrations, vulnerability can't English again, vulnerability patches and API migrations. It currently focuses on Java, but they have plans also to work on Kotlin and other things. It works with Maven and Gradle, and it comes with a bunch of existing recipes for migrations, but you can also author your own. Um, so they have, and they have uh, documentation where they have a quick start guide if you want to do a quick tutorial to see how it works. Um, it's really interesting. I did the tutorial or, or the quick start. Um, so you start by adding the plugin. And if you add the plugin, you can use the discover command to see which recipes are out there. So currently they have, or at least one or two weeks ago when I first did this, they had 247 recipes and five style guides. So the, style gu the styles will auto format your code into a particular format, and the recipes do migrations. Um, and this is a really interesting tool. I'm almost sad I don't have any production repositories to work on with this, um, except for, yeah, just, just work on it for, for fun. Um, so to use it, you need to um, activate some recipes in the plugin, so configure the recipes that you want to use. Uh, the, the quick start starts with just an auto format. And if you have the, uh, sorry, if you have an active recipe configured, you can run rewrite to make changes to your code uh, that you'll see in the um, terminal. You can then check the uh, changes that were made either in your um, uh, commit tool window or via git diff in the command line. Uh, and make sure that those changes are what you want before you commit them. But they also have, um, yeah, migrations, for example, from Spring, uh, Spring Boot 1 to 2, or JUnit 4 to 5, and even combined recipes. So uh, in the quick start, they go through the uh, Spring Boot and JUnit 4 and 5. If you run that recipe, 
It will update the spring dependencies or spring boot dependencies. It will remove the JUnit 4 dependencies, add the JUnit 5, and update your code. Um, it says it doesn't support the automatic update of Gradle dependencies, so you'll have to manually do that, but it will uh, update them in Maven. Uh, and I think that this is a really interesting tool that can make our lives easier. Although I know that there are similar tools out there. Um, and if you, this is a tool that you're interested in, uh, Tim Tebake, who is also here today, uh, but not speaking, I think. Um, he did a talk on this um, most recently at DevOx, where he's talking about uh, how to use uh, Open Rewrite and more of the details if you are interested. Um, and he also did a talk at Spring I.O. last summer. Uh, in Barcelona, uh, where he went into the details of uh, Spring Boot Migrator, which is currently experimental, which is also based on Open Rewrite. Um, so this, this is a really interesting development, I think, in making our lives easier in migrating uh, our code. So in conclusion, um, I want you to think about carefully about which dependencies you use and periodically also re-evaluate whether you want to continue using them. Uh, I hope I've given you some ideas uh, on tools that you can use to automate the checks and, and to make updating easier. And I hope we can stay safe. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, ah! Link to the slides, either the link or the QR code. Uh, I have not updated these yet because the internet has been spotty at best, but I'll update them when I get back in range. Uh, and there are older versions of this talk and the slides on this page now. Any questions? The question is, the bots that I mentioned seem to be running in the cloud, but is it possible to run them on-premise? So, yes. Renovate, yes. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Niels. I knew that one. Uh, so if you go to the Renovate website, they will tell you that there are several options. So you can add it on GitLab, you can run it on-premises, and there's another option, I forget. Um, so for Renovate, for sure. Dependable, I'm actually not sure because it's GitHub native, so maybe if you have on-prem GitHub, I don't know if that's a thing. I don't work for GitHub. Um, and Dependable, yeah, they, they acquired it in 2019. Um, and as far as sneak, we'd have to ask Brian, who is also around here somewhere. You might know him, he speaks here a lot. Um, Renovate has Docker containers, I'm told. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, thanks. Drinks. <laughs> <laughs>